Um, okay, great. So it's uh, it's uh, my absolute pleasure to to introduce uh, Justin Hart, who is a, an assistant professor at uh, UT Austin. And so, uh, yeah, he he uh, completed his uh, PhD uh, with uh, with Brian uh, Scassadati in in CS at uh, at Yale. And so, um, Justin has always been very interested in the, in the emulation of uh, developmental processes in infants, and this translates into uh, can be experimented with with in uh, with self awareness as, as modeled in in robots. And so. Uh, so he's leading the charge in the uh, embodied uh, robotics uh, revolution, and um, and he's also very much interested in in the problems related to human uh, robot interaction. And so this then took him into a, a postdoctoral fellowship at uh, at UBC here uh, in mechanical engineering with uh, Professor Elizabeth Croft, and in particular working on uh, the the prediction of reach trajectories so to to improve the, the speed and fluidity of of human robot uh, interaction, and yeah, so currently he's uh, he has uh, started at uh, at UT Austin as assistant pro assistant professor of practice teaching, uh, it, where he teaches the the autonomous robot stream of, um, and I I assume he's going to be speaking about various pieces of of the work uh, there, and so yeah, he, he's doing a lot of work with uh, with uh, Professor Peter Stone there, and um, he also. Uh, Helps uh, helps run the or, or the the UT Austin Villa uh, RoboCup team, which is uh, which has done uh, very well over the years. Um, so, Justin, it's an absolute fantastic pleasure to to welcome you, and uh, please take it away. Oh man, thanks so much. Uh, um, yeah, that was a really good intro. That was that was that was more that was more detailed than I think I've I've ever had anyone uh, give. That's that's thank you. Uh, am I sh sharing screen? I am sharing screen. Uh, so you guys see the correct screen, right? Getting robots into every home and workplace. Awesome. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess just to jump in, uh, since I've come to UT Austin, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this problem of what do we need to do to make it practical to see a robot in every home and workplace? Um, and you know, this traces through my work in artificial intelligence. It traces through human-robot interaction. Um, and a lot of the motivation for this has been a variety of problems uh, that we've encountered during working on projects on service robots. So robots that are intended to work alongside people to make their day-to-day -day lives easier or to make their jobs easier. Um, I'm gonna start with sort of a story that should be familiar to everyone here, which is, oops, uh, you know, robots started off in factories. Uh, they started in factories because Honestly, the regular factory setting, at least the factory setting that robots started in, doesn't require a lot of artificial intelligence. It doesn't require lots of sensing or perception. Uh, it can all be done as sort of forward kinematic motions using G-code. So the robots you know, in this video are programmed pretty much the same way you would program a lathe or a CNC milling machine or a 3D printer. Um, they're not really doing anything intelligent. Um, those robots are placed into work cells, right? A work cell is a big cage where the robot works. And, you know, this serves two purposes, really. The uh, activity in the work cell is very, very, very predictable. Things come in on a conveyor belt or they're placed into the work cell in some exact, pretty much fixture position. Then the robot performs a precise motion and the product is done. And when you hear about industrial accidents involving robots, usually what has happened is someone has walked into a work cell during a time where the robot's in operation and the robot has no way of perceiving the person's presence there, no way of stopping or anything, and then that person is usually injured or killed, unfortunately. Um, but robotics has expanded rapidly over the past 20 years. And the first thing that most people probably remember as part of robots expansion, uh, part of sort of a revolution in robots is the Kiva robots, which are used in Amazon warehouses. And, you know, one could go on for hours and hours about how interesting the specifics of how the Kiva robots are designed is. But, you know, when you get right down to it, the thing that was the big victory for Kiva robots is that, you know, now there's like Amazon Prime for 70 bucks, you get at, you know, overnight shipping because they've managed to make their supply chain so quick and reliable. And part of that has been reducing the human effort. 
to package a product. Uh, since then, there have been a variety of robotics companies that have popped up. And I have to admit that there's a lot of bias in this particular selection because these are mostly Austin companies that I've had some interaction with. Um, the one in the top left-hand corner here is Fox Robotics. This is a robotic forklift, which unloads cargo from the back of a semi truck onto the floor of a warehouse. So this is sort of, you know, everything up to where you might use a system like a Kiva robot. And on the top right is Pensa Systems. They take store stock information uh, using these drones that fly around. So these are operating in close proximity to people, uh, but they're kind of like monitoring when the people are in the grocery store aisles and then going in when they can do this unobtrusively. Uh, the bottom left is Andrea Tomaz's company. She's faculty at UT Austin over here. Uh, this is the Diligent Moxie. It fetches items uh, from shelves in hospitals so nurses don't have to do that. A nurse has a tablet and then the nurse calls the robot to the observation room or operating room where the item is needed and the items just fetched. So the nurse is free to spend time doing nursing things as opposed to object retrieval. And then uh, the, the bottom right is the Savvy Oak Relay. That's a robot that's used for room service. And you know, down in the kitchen, the robot is sort of loaded into a, a cooler in the top, and then it drives to the room where the occupant you know, has ordered the food. They retrieve the stuff off the top of the robot, and then that's kind of the deal. Um, and of course, you know, I think that many people have seen, if they haven't seen the Savvy Oak Relay, they've probably gone to a restaurant recently where there's been some type of robot waiter where there is an item loaded into the back of the robot, it drives up to your table, and then when you retrieve the items off of the robot, you kind of tap a button on it and tell it to go back to the kitchen. Um, if I look at these videos, what I see on this chart that I've built here is that on the left-hand side, the earlier victories are robots in applications that involve fewer people and less complexity. There's just less you know people introduce complexity into the environment because they're moving around things in ways that aren't monitored by the robot they're introducing items into the space that the robot may not recognize with the object recognition systems we're able to simplify these problems on the left a lot to make them easier for the robot and then on the right these are less constrained environments you know they are not as chaotic as deploying a robot in the home right they're not as chaotic as just making a robot that can go around your office building and retrieve things for you, but they are significantly less structured and there are significantly more people around than, for instance, a robot operating in a work cell, right? So even though we're still a long way from general purpose service robots in the home, uh, the challenge has led me and my collaborators to form a team to compete in RoboCup at home and to investigate these problems, because I really would like to see robots at everyone's home someday. Um, when most people think of RoboCup, they think of something kind of like this video here. Uh, this is RoboCup Standard Platform League Soccer. And so in the Standard Platform League, uh, basically it's scored exactly the way you would expect you know, it to be scored. A team wins based on scoring more goals. And the problems in SPL soccer can be reduced to things like making the robot perform kicks better or walk faster. Usually those two things actually are major determinants in terms of who wins. And then after that, there's probably the, the multi-agent coordination and things of that nature. Um, there are all sorts of rules in RoboCup soccer regulating, for instance, what types of things you're allowed to trans, uh, transmit over the network or how you're allowed to coordinate your agents. Um, this is really like a multi-agent planning problem, plus maybe a reinforcement learning problem in terms of the behavior of the robot. Um, but I work uh, mainly on RoboCup at Home, which focus on domestic tasks situated in a simulated living space. Um, a RoboCup at Home arena looks kind of like this. It's sort of like a TV set built out of, you know, convention stall furniture. Uh, we get a lot of IKEA furniture because IKEA is available in every country almost. And, you know, the tasks in RoboCup at Home, I'll get into, but there are things like, uh, taking out trash, putting things away, serving drinks. Um, and I think that a lot of people look at RoboCup at home and they see this problem of perception, motion planning and manipulation. 
And certainly all those things are very true. But the thing that makes it so difficult, I think, is that it's placed in a human environment where the robot actually needs to interact fluently with the people around it. And that, that creates a lot and a lot of challenges that need to be addressed. Um, RoboCup is broken up into two types of tasks and then two stages. So the stages are sort of the level of difficulty of the task. And then the breakup of housekeeper and party host is sort of the variety, the flavor of the task. When you think of housekeeper tasks, think object recognition and motion planning. And when you think party host tasks, think human robot interaction. Um, examples of housekeeper tasks, uh, for instance, are like storing groceries is probably the most popular one. Uh, in that task, uh, grocery items are placed onto a kitchen table, and then the robot is instructed to shell them in a kitchen cupboard. And then the robot is supposed to recognize which items are kind of related to each other and place them together. So for instance, if you had orange soda and grape soda, those should be uh, put next to each other. Uh, you wouldn't put the orange soda next to iced tea, for instance, if grape soda was available, right? It needs to be next to the most semantically similar item in the cupboard. Uh, so that's storing grocery and party host. These tasks are uh, much more oriented towards human robot interaction. So serving drinks, for instance, you have to drive up to all the uh, you know, people who are attending a party and then you need to ask them their drink order and go retrieve their drink and then bring it back to them you know, so that the correct person's matched with the correct drink. And there's all sorts of little wrinkles in that task to make it more challenging. Uh, and then stage two is just the much more difficult versions of that. So to give you an idea of what the very most difficult task in RoboCup at home is, um, during the last day of the competition, we take all the robots, we load them up on a truck, we take all the participants, we load them up on a bus, we put them into a real restaurant that they haven't been allowed to map in advance. And then the robot is supposed to act like a member of the wait staff. Um, you know, if these tasks sound kind of like sci-fi robotics as opposed to current state-of-the-art robotics, uh, I wouldn't blame you for saying so, they, they do. Um, People solve these tasks with all sorts of little tricks, right? And so in the case of the restaurant, there's always a bartender who's preparing the items for the robot to bring to the people. The robot goes up to the people and takes the order. And the way that they know which people to go to to take the orders is the people are instructed to kind of wave their hands over their head. So you have this motion cue to say like, this is the person who you need to go up to. And the reason you have that is because they don't stop business in the restaurant. So, you know, there's this trade-off, it's in this, you know, very difficult place to operate. And yet we have this simplifying cue to help the robot kind of navigate that situation. Um, let's look at a few videos, right? You know, if I'm gonna talk about doing robots and doing robot competitions, I, I think that I would be remiss to not show you some video of the robots actually doing the things. Um, this is one of the favorites of my team here, UT Austin Villa at home. This is called Take Out the Garbage. Um, this is solved using neural networks that do object recognition for the garbage can and for the lid. Um, when we developed this, uh, the sort of state of the art was maybe YOLO v3 uh, for recognizing the lid. So obviously YOLO will not tell you the orientation of the handle on the top of the garbage can, which is why the robot does that weird thing with its wrist where it's like, I'm gonna try it like this and I'm gonna try it like this. So if one of these orientations is going to snap the um, handle into an orientation that works with my robot. And then the robot just kind of plunges its gripper down into the garbage bag itself, you know, grabbing anywhere on a garbage bag will work if it has, you know, some stuff in it. The robot's then supposed to take um, the garbage bag, you know, outside the house, so to speak. So there's a designated collection point, which represents, you know, where you'd be wheeling the bin out inside of your home. Uh, due to the orientation in my lab, we don't have the robot go out the front door, um, but in the competition itself, it kind of like scoots out the front door and then drops off the garbage just right outside of it. Here we have our collection item in this black tape. Um, another fun one is serving drinks. I'll let the audio, do you guys hear the audio? I think I need to set up sharing to share the audio here. Let me fix that real quick. I'll, I'll get that sorted. So sorry about that. Uh, share screen, and then I need to share sound and optimize for video clip. There we go. All right. So yeah, we get this, the audio now. Thanks. 
This this one's a little awkward. We're improving it this year. The robot kind of drives up to a person, and it's like. So switching between like something that was generating a beep and something that was generating speech was like a little bit of an ask uh, on that platform that year, which is why the robot says beep uh, to prompt the person to speak. Uh, we're actually playing around with the notion of using large language models to make that whole speech interaction a little bit more fluent. Um, and then, you know, the robot, you know, sort of takes stock of the items on the table, uh, does a recognition task and recognizes the sprite, then, you know, you can kind of guess how the rest goes. It, it drives back to Marika, and then it'll kind of drop the can in her hand. Uh, despite the fact that I worked on handovers, uh, we we have this very awkward handover, which is common in the league. It goes like this. Yeah, so that's another thing that I would really like to improve. Um, but jumping in, there are two basic approaches to solving the problems in RoboCup at home that uh, teams take. One is to write a different program for each round. And that is usually what first year teams do. So uh, you build a library common capabilities course, you know, reaching for an object, you know, works the same regardless of the context. So you write, you know, your general purpose reaching algorithm. Uh, but basically each round gets its own little program. In 2017, when we formed the team, that was our basic approach. And then, you know, what the teams do is they kind of mature is they move to building an AI architecture for the robot and then implementing all the rounds in that architecture. Uh, and I'll show you what our architecture is that we started working on in 2018. Um, we have an architecture called Laird Architecture for Autonomous Interactive Robots. Uh, it, it is almost like a classic three-tiered architecture uh, if you've looked at such things, except that at the very top, the, the finite state machines have an interruptibility feature that allows us to react to human input very quickly. Uh, you know, this gives us um, the response to, the response speed that we need in order for if a person gives the robot a cue like stop or something like that, the robot can pretty much immediately respond. That's the big, big difference. So there's a finite state machine at the top. There's a planner, which uh, you know you can state the problems in predicate logic, and then or it is predicate logic because we use the Klingo planner. And then when it sees a predicate that corresponds to an action that comes out basically as a stream with a string, then it goes and performs that action. And then there's a series of subprograms called action executors, which run at those times. And those things might be like pick up an item, navigate to a place, follow this person. Um, that's basically. The, the core component. And then there's a pretty good knowledge representation architecture we have because you can be building a very large knowledge base. Uh, what we do is we store all the atoms in a database uh, along with types, and then we're able to query the database in order to form the input to the planner uh, with the relevant atoms in order to do planning. Um, the most interesting part of this architecture right now is how we ground items in our knowledge base. And there are two basic approaches that uh, people tend to take doing this. The first is grounding as the robot sees items. So if the robot's driving around, it might perform a scanning behavior uh, while it's performing other tasks. Uh, and then as it, as it performs that scanning behavior, it'll, it'll put in uh, atoms representing the groundings of the objects that it sees. Uh, the second is that you might accept a command and then based on that command, begin to search for the item. And uh, to optimize this, usually you kind of look in the likely locations for the item. So if you say, you know, give me a Coke, then the Coke is in the fridge and it'll begin to search in the fridge. Our approach marries the two. First, the robot grounds an object as it sees items. But if the item has not been found, what it does is it generates hypothetical items. So instead of starting a search, it goes to the place that's the likely location. And then when it sees an item, it either grounds it with a real item or replaces it with a hypothetical one. So you see what happens here, right? There are, what will happen is a bunch of hypothetical items pop up. The robot makes a motion plan to one of them. When it sees that it doesn't exist, it does a replan and finds the next hypothetical item until it's exhausted its list of hypothetical items. And during this time, 
if it stumbles on the item, it'll still ground it and then go to that because it's real. So that's basically how the robot uh, performs this task. Here is an example of this working. Um, so I'll just talk over this. So what the robot's doing is it's it's asking uh, uh, Yu Chen Zhang, one of the PhD students in the program over here, uh, what she would like for it to do. And then uh, she says, I want you to bring me an apple from the kitchen. Uh, the robot hasn't seen an apple yet. So, or okay, I'm sorry. First she says, bring me a piece of fruit. And then the robot enters into a clarification dialogue because a piece of fruit isn't that precise. So, so she says, I want an apple. The robot goes to places where apples might be by generating hypothetical apples. You can see that there's an apple on the kitchen counter there, um, but the robot didn't see it as it passed by. It's gonna continue its motion plan to the location where we'll look for an apple first, which is in what we call our cupboard is you know the shelf over here. It looks for the exact location where it thinks the apple might be. It's scanning the cupboard now. This scanning is basically uh, building a 3D point cloud of the cupboard, plus uh, running the OLO object detector, and then doing plane segmentation on all the objects in the cupboard. And of course, that goes relatively slowly. But since it didn't do the 2D task, it doesn't bother with the 3D task. All right. Now it says, OK. That hypothetical apple didn't exist. Let me go and find another one. Then it finds the real apple, reifying the apple, and then brings it back to Yu Chen. Okay, so that's one version. Uh, this is kind of a long video, so I don't think I'll play the whole thing. Uh, the end is kind of humorous because I'll give you the punchline. Now it's going to bring the apple back to Yu Chen because it found it. Let's suppose it didn't find the apple, right? What the what the robot does is, you know, it doesn't call Yu Chen a liar. It says, hey, I generated this hypothesis that there is an apple based on the fact that you asked me for an apple. Turned out that there was no such apple, so I wasn't able to complete the command. And that's kind of the punchline in this video. Um, let me show you restaurant, since I told you this is the most difficult task in RoboCut Home. I'm actually going to show you another team's robot that performs really well in this task. This is a team that, that wins this task every year. Uh, since this is so hard, I might as well show you the best performers. Uh, so, you know, you see myself and a couple of my students in this video. Uh, Gilbert, who's the gentleman on the left here, has waved to the robot and the robot is kind of navigating around trying to get to the appropriate place to take Gilbert's order. And it's going to drive up. Gilbert is going to ask the robot for different things. Um, I don't remember what he asked for. I think he asked for a ginger beer, uh, which was one of the items used in RoboCup at home that year. So then the robot has already done the part where it's identifying where is the bar and where is the bartender. And so the robot's going to drive back to the area identified as the bar. I'm the bartender, so I'm going to give the robot the object, which is this ginger beer. And we'll just wait a minute. So here I am. And of course, we're very cautious about the grips on these robots and um, you know, very cautious about dropping things on the robot and damaging it. So you'll see everyone kind of scramble under the robot to rescue the robot if the robot doesn't grip the object properly. So here we go. And there's that. And then the robot will, you know, drive back over to Gilbert. And then it still can't get through in the way that its motion planner wants to on the first shot. So it'll go over here and, and drop the other in Gilbert's hand. And it does the three, two, one thing as well. So, you know, one thing that I noticed whenever I watched that video is the awkward handover that's very popular in RoboCup at Home. Uh, RoboCup at Home seeks to be the challenge that's largely about human robot interaction. Historically, it has been more of a planning challenge than an HRI challenge. So, I've been working on pushing tests into the league, which push innovation on HRI. 
Uh, here's a task that I introduced called hand me that. And the notion is basically that the robot point or that a person points at objects and the robot recognizes what the person's pointing at. So there's Alex over there. Alex is pointed at the onion and then Hero, uh, the TU Eindhoven HSR recognizes that Alex is pointing at the onion and then indicates that by touching it. And so, you know, Hero is now touching the kiwi and then uh, towards the ginger beer over here. And, you know, this has generated some papers on this topic, which I'm very proud of. It's also um, produced some systems that are crazy robust. Um, to give you an example of how well TU Eindhoven's uh, uh, point detector works, um, they demonstrated that people in the stands could point at objects and the robot would recognize what it was pointing, what they were pointing at. So that was pretty impressive. Uh, as impressive as Robot Cup at Home is, there are some major gaps. The demos are impressive, but they are actually impossible to solve using current technology. They're solvable because the tasks are actually very, very um, structured. Teams are given 2.5 setup days. Uh, they thoroughly map the arena. Uh, they set up landmarks where all the people and objects should be. Uh, they custom retrain all their object recognition systems. And then when the judges give commands, there are rounds where the judge gives a very open-ended command. It can be like, go get me the thing from Room X, right? Or it could be like, set breakfast up for me, right? Um, which is pretty um, broad. However, even though those commands sound like they're generated on the fly, they're only chosen from a limited grammar and the judges have to read from a laptop what the randomly generated command is. So uh, teams have access to that grammar. Uh, you know, they aren't as open-ended as they look. At UC Austin, we do have efforts trying to address these gaps. And uh, I'm gonna take a moment to talk about some of the good things going on at UT Austin. And then I'm gonna jump into uh, one of the areas that we're working on. So uh, there's a new robotics research consortium called Texas Robotics. It's an interdisciplinary group uh, drawing from uh, you know, computer science and mechanical engineering, aerospace engineering, electrical engineering. Uh, we have this brand new facility where uh, faculty who work in those areas whose primary focus is robotics have the option of you know, moving their laboratories and offices to so we can collaborate more with each other. UT Austin has what are called graduate portfolio programs, which are um, transcriptable programs that, you know, aren't degree programs. So, you know, you're not getting a degree in robotics, you get a degree in say mechanical engineering, uh, but it says on your transcript that you had a focus in robotics. And then of course, uh, we've been writing a lot more grants together. Here's some pictures of what the place looks like. Here's our courtyard. Every new building in UT Austin gets like a statue placed in their courtyard, which is pretty amazing. Uh, equal to 1% the cost of the building. Um, and then here are some students who I work with in my lab space, uh, students who have taken my robotics course uh, or who are working with me as research assistants. And then down in the lower right hand corner, you can see uh, the part of my lab space that's sort of set up as a simulated apartment. So down at the end, there's like a kitchen sink and there's a dishwasher and a fridge. Uh, and then there's like a, like a kitchen sort of bar table. There's a TV in there now. It's intended to simulate you know, what an apartment looks like. Then we have this other program which is intended to sort of make this all a little bit more real. And this is under UT Austin Bridging Barriers programs, one called Good Systems. Uh, and the notion is to develop robots with real jobs at the UT Austin campus. And even though Texas Robotics is interdisciplinary, this is really interdisciplinary. I have uh, collaborators from Information Science, I have collaborators from the School of Communication and from the Department of English uh, and from the library system and from the Texas Advanced Computing Center. Uh, all working together to put robots into real jobs. And the idea is not just that the robot should do the job in the simplest way possible, but we should ask, how should the robot be, do be doing the job? Do people like the robots there? What jobs should robots be doing? Um, you know, and what is it like when, when robots are working day-to-day uh, -day in a job as opposed to doing sort of a demonstration? And then we have another program, which is another portfolio program in ethical artificial intelligence. Um, you know, so what happens when there are delivery robots going between libraries and crowded sidewalks and hallways? Well, one of the problems that I've really come to focus on is something called social navigation. Uh, I think that people are starting to be familiar with this problem because it has become a popular HRI problem. But you know, the difference between social navigation 
and say autonomous vehicles is that autonomous vehicles have traffic laws to dictate how they should behave. And people really don't, you know, people walk directly towards each other and then kind of like read each other's body language and read, you know, what they think the intention of the other person is in order to get out of each other's way. And this is uh, completely, you know, sort of fluid to people. This isn't something that people have to think about. Uh, that's why this video is titled Awkward Situations, the Hallway Dance, because there are two people who aren't paying attention to what they're doing and then they get in each other's way, right? So this is a problem that is um, very easy for people. You know, if I define the hallway passing problem as sort of a sub problem of social navigation, People pass each other gracefully when navigating shared spaces, but robots struggle both to understand people and to make their intentions understood. Um, I've had the opportunity to witness this, uh, you know, in action repeatedly because Peter Stone and I have a research program called Building Wide Intelligence. In Building Wide Intelligence, we've been fielding service robots that do things like give directions or provide object delivery around the computer science department, and now the robotics building. Uh, for several years. They run constantly during the workday. And one of the inspirations for this was actually uh, twofold. One, uh, our old admin used to complain that she felt like the robot would run her over. Uh, the robot would drive right up to you and then just kind of stop when it gets too close. And then there was actually a, an incident where we had our PhD student visit day, my first year here, and students were kind of lined up in the hallway in front of our laboratory space. And one robot went, went to one end of the hallway and stopped and one robot went to the other end of the hallway and stopped and both of the robots were programmed to go directly down the middle of the hallway so there wasn't really a gap that was wide enough for people to squeeze around the robots so and the robots just stopped right so what eventually happened is the people all went into our lab space and walked out the other side because the robots were blocking uh, the egress from the hallway um, We've already went through kind of what's the difference between social navigation and, and why we need to be doing this. Uh, at the time, we had a master's student who was uh, interested in solving this problem. After he saw this incident, he said, I'm going to solve this by putting turn signals on the robot. Now, I'm going to show you some results that say that turn signals don't really work in terms of social navigation. There are papers that say that turn signals work. Uh, I think that when we get to the punchline in this paper, you're going to see why I say that turn signals don't really work. So we built a test hallway in our new facility. This is before it was renovated. And we modeled the hallway as sort of three traffic lanes. So you could picture that there's the robot in the middle lane, and there's a person at the other end of the hallway coming down. And then we had three distances that we modeled. One is the distance at which the robot should signal. So the distance at which the robot should fire its turn signal. One is the distance at which the robot should execute its turn. And one is the distance at which the robot should just stop because it's too close to the person. And uh, we measured what we call conflicts, which are times when clearly the robot wasn't understood by the person. Either the robot stopped because they were going into the same lane and blocking each other's path, or basically the robot the person just wasn't getting out of the robot's way. They weren't going in the direction of the robot intended for them to do as indicated by their turn signal. And to make one other thing sort of apparent, uh, people sometimes see the output of this study and they think, oh, if people think that the turn signal means the opposite thing, then you should just say like, like people sometimes would say, the turn signal clearly meant the lane I should go to not the lane that the robot intends to go to, right? So when a car turns, they're saying, I'm going right. People would say, the robot wants me to go to its right, right? These were people who clearly misinterpreted the turn signal. We made this task as, as impossible as possible. If you didn't understand the signal, then the robot was definitely gonna get into your way. What we did is we made the robot physically do everything as counterintuitively as possible so you would only get out of the way if you understood the signal. We ran this pilot study, we measured conflicts, and what we found is that the turn signal didn't work at all. Half of the people interpreted the signal as the direction that they should walk in, and half of the people interpreted the signal as indicating the direction of the robot's motion, exactly 50-50. So what we did is we introduced this notion of a passive demonstration. And what a passive demonstration is, is the robot makes a turn in front of the study participant, but it makes the turn far enough away that 
it doesn't matter because it's not, you know, the person and the robot aren't about to pass each other at the time the robot makes the demonstration. So this isn't us saying, this is how the turn signal works and we're going to demonstrate it to you. This is just the robot making a turn with the turn signal. And what we found is, is that if the per so then the robot gets closer to the person and needs to pass the person and then uses the turn signal a second time, at which point the person almost always gets out of the robot's way. So what this finding indicates, so, well, let me jump into next. So we built a two by two study in order to demonstrate this. So on one variable, it's whether or not there's a demonstration. And on the other axis, it's whether or not the robot's using a, a, an LED. So it's, it's a demonstration of the turn with or without an LED. And that's basically the study. So no demonstration, no LED looks like this. And the robot and the person will come into conflict. So the robot is going to go into the left lane, which is counterintuitive to everyone in North America. And then the person and the robot basically just walk up to each other and the person walks around the robot. That's what a conflict looks like. In this case, there's no demonstration, but you'll see the LED turn signal go off. So you can see, you know, here's the robot and, you know, it's blinking its turn signal. The person doesn't understand it, comes up to it, and then eventually they just kind of side sway past each other. So here's a demonstration with no LED. So the robot's going to make the turn, but it's not blinking its turn signal. It's going to make the second turn. Look at this person walk directly into the robot's path and then just kind of scooch by it, right? And then finally, demonstration in LED. So the robot starts off by making a turn with its turn signal, makes a second turn with its turn signal, and now the person gets it, right? That demonstration, even though we didn't tell them, hey, this is the robot tutorial, was enough for the person to understand the turn signal. And you know, here's what this looks like. No demonstration, no LED resulted in a conflict 100% of the time, whereas demonstration and LED, you know, it wasn't perfect, but it worked 20% of the time statistically significantly uh, down at the uh, alpha 0.01 level. So observing that, we wanted something that people would understand the very first time. And something that's been studied very heavily in HRI and something that's been studied very heavily in terms of how people coordinate each other's motion is the role of gaze. So we asked, what role does gaze play when people pass each other in a hallway? Uh, we built a three condition study where we had research confederates do one of three behaviors. Uh, they would walk through the student activity center, which is a very busy building in UT Austin. And they would either perform what we call a congruent look, which is looking in the direction that they intend to walk, incongruent looking and walking in the opposite direction, or looking down at their cell phone. And what we found was that congruent gaze you know, they still bump, we measured how many times they physically bumped into someone else. This could be either they brushed next to each other or they hit each other. And what we found is that in this very busy hallway where there's hundreds of people, 25% uh, of the time, people would bump into the research confederate anyway, even if they were doing what was expected. If they were looking against that flow of traffic and against where they were intending to go, uh, that bumped up 16%. And no gaze actually resulted in about the same level of conflict, which we can kind of interpret as like the gaze, the incongruent gaze signal is telling people something wrong. The no gaze signal is telling people nothing. So they just don't react to the gaze. This is what this looked like in practice. This is what we trained our participants to do. This is my collaborator, Ruth Mursky, doing congruent, incongruent, and no gaze look. So then we put this into our hallway. And what we did is we tested the turn signal against the gaze cue. Uh, there is a 3D printable robot head called the Maki head. Uh, what we did is we actually imported this into the Unity game engine and made it a virtual agent that would look to the left or to the right based on what the robot wanted to do with its turn. Of course, it's always looking to the left because of the way we set up this experiment. But the head turns in the direction that the robot wants to look. It's it's not the most beautiful gaze cue, but it's obvious what it's doing. And then uh, we shot this out against the LED signal. So this is kind of what that looked like. You know, here's our LED. And here's our gaze. And now we do have better models of gaze that, that make a better looking gaze. 
but this is what it looks like. So here's the LED going. You know, we took the screen off of the robot. You can't see the LED fire this time because it's only on the front of the robot, but it shoots its LED right after it passes that black line. And here's someone walking directly up to the robot and kind of getting in the robot's way. And then in our second condition, our gaze condition, the same thing, the robot is making the gaze cue as soon as it passes that black line. And then you can see the pedestrian like immediately getting out of the robot's way, you know, even though the robot's not getting out of their way. All right, the LEDs resulted in conflict 100% of the time, the gaze cue resulted in conflict 50% of the time. Can we improve on this? Yes. You know, the gaze cue can work better, the robot can respond to the person. Uh, we've done some studies of that nature. They aren't published yet, so I haven't put them into this presentation yet. Um, but what about making the robot respond to the person? Uh, you know, can we make a robot respond to the person's gaze cue? Um, we decided to study this in virtual reality. And the reason for that is that you could use something like a Vicon NMX motion capture system, and you could use something like uh, Toby eyeglasses to measure the person's gaze. But that involves actually quite a lot of engineering effort, uh, merging the eye gaze uh, location to the motion capture location. It requires a lot of post-processing, um, and it's very expensive. You know, we have a Vicon, but it's a quarter million dollars. Uh, adding a participant uh, for gaze using Toby glasses three is 20,000 per participant. Uh, and I was getting pretty excited about virtual reality. Uh, this was kind of during COVID still. Uh, it only cost me $3,500 per participant for full body tracking. And about uh, 1,700 is instrumented in this, uh, in this demonstration. Um, but it's also already integrated. I gave this project to three undergraduates and they finished the development of the software in a month and the anal analysis of the results within three months, we had a paper. Uh, so that's you know, a pretty nice turnaround. Um, what we did is we put study participants into this virtual room with five targets. And each participant's task was to walk towards a target uh, based on an audible cue that was given to them, you know, say walk to target one. Um, and this is sort of an extension of previous work that worked on head pose. What we're doing here is we're building a detector which will anticipate which of these targets a person will walk towards, right? This is what our data sampling looks like but it looks like the video doesn't want to play. So let's see, oh, there we go. This is, uh, this is a Brar Anwar, you know, walking through my old lab space with the headset. And then here's what it looks like from his perspective in virtual reality. And then, you know, the machine learning task is identify which target he's walking to without knowing in advance. To read these charts, um, you know, each different colored dot or line is, the anticipated target that the person is walking towards. Uh, and this is against how long, normalized against time, how long they've been walking. And so this is based on gaze yaw or head yaw. And what we see is if, if we're basing this based on gaze, you know, really early, you know, less than 5% of the way through their trajectory, we're able to identify which target they're looking towards. Whereas head yaw, uh, we're able to do this uh, at about 25%. And so, you know, there are features that can be used to predict where a person's about to walk, but gaze is the earliest one that we have so far. Where are we going with this? Well, I've got two of these systems and we're gonna have people pass each other in a hallway. And we're gonna analyze the gaze and body language that they exchange. Uh, and I'm also working on a gaze detector that goes on a robot so that we can use that gaze detection to read where a person's gonna go. Even though the timeframes that we're talking about in terms of like being able to determine where a person's walking based on their gaze are, they're very short. It's like gives us like three meters of prediction. That three meter prediction is still enough that the robot can get out of the person's way. Uh, we've also done a version of this, which uh, is in preparation for publication with the Boston Dynamics spot, uh, predicting where a person's about to walk based on uh, uh, where they're standing. Uh, and so we'll, we're gonna submit that to the HRI conference uh, this fall. So we'll see how that does. Um, there is other stuff, but I'm definitely at time. So I, I knew I would be at time. So I just wanted to kind of mention it. I'm doing a lot of semantic slam for augmented reality and robotics these days. Uh, this is work that's funded by Cisco Systems. Um, if you look at the classic slam problem, 
what is provided to the robot is information about where it can navigate to. It's not navigable information such as go to the kitchen. It's navigation information such as this is the empty space and specify to me where I'm going to go based on coordinates x, y, z, x, y, z, w, right? This is useful in some context, but if you want the robot to do something useful, then what happens is a person is usually annotating the map after the fact. So going back to RoboCup at home, you know, we get these 2.5 setup days to annotate the arena. What we do with that time is retrain all of our object recognition systems, but we also drive the robot to exact coordinates on the floor. And we say, hey, when you're interacting with a person, drive right here to do so. And when you're looking for objects, these are all the surfaces that objects might be placed on. The flavor of the semantic mapping research that I'm doing right now is identifying where all the objects are autonomously and identifying where the good, good locations are for things like different interactions autonomously. Um, and so, you know, we're going to see where that's going. That's, that's work that's still kind of in its infancy. Uh, we've had a couple papers on it. Uh, but with that, I think I'm going to wrap up. So thanks so much. And I'll open up to questions. Great, many thanks. Fantastic. Thanks so okay, this is this is where the the applause on Zoom uh, always sounds so lame, but uh, but it, it, it is what it is. Uh, anyhow, fantastic. Uh, let's uh, open it up for questions. I'm happy to start off. So so um, yeah, I was wondering about the um, to what extent. Uh, can you actually read the, can participants actually read the, if you like the, the body motion of the robot? So, so, uh, so that, uh, you know, a, a, a robot that slows down if it's uncertain about what you're going to do and, or just determinately, but, you know, it, it, uh, yeah, in, in North America, it would probably veer to the right just by default. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so there's, there's a lot of different work on this and, and honestly, I don't think that there's a super straightforward answer yet. There, there, there's answers as to like what works better than what. Uh, so, you know, the one thing that almost always works is if the robot just goes to the right hand side of the hallway, you know, it's gonna, it's basically gonna be right 90% of the time. So if it just goes to the right, it'll be getting out of the person's way. And if it does it really early, it gives the person a lot of, a lot of room for, for, you know, error, right? Uh, the version of this that I do in the hallway is intended to, to minimize the person's ability to react to the, to the body language of the robot so we can test like the individual little social cues that we're putting onto the robot. And, and Google has a similar setup. So I have the hallway setup and I've been collaborating with Google. We have a paper who was just accepted to RAL uh, where we treat this as a reinforcement learning problem. Uh, and so, of course, like like teasing out what people are reacting to in the reinforcement learning context is a little challenging. Uh, but the um, you know their version of this problem is I, I can't remember the exact term that they have for it, even though I've been working with them. But it's like it's like head-on navigation. And so what the robot does is it makes a it makes a direct like they don't start off in a hallway; they start off in like an atrium or like the entryway of their building. And the robot steers to head directly towards the person, right? So it makes like a beeline for them. And then it reacts once it's gone on this collision course. So it's a very similar thing uh, that's intended to do it in a slightly more organic environment. Um, but, you know, there, the, the things that are sort of known to work, if you put a turn signal on the robot, uh, there are papers that say it works. And the reason that I think they see that is that they're doing repeated trials. And so we're doing one shot and in that one shot, the person doesn't recognize it the first time. But if they see the turn signal a lot, they'll usually recognize it. Um, and then some of the other uh, um, modeling techniques out there, there's like what's called the social, social forces model. Uh, this really has its, its um, sort of beginnings in virtual reality and in video game technology to make crowds look realistic as they pass by. And then there's, but people are fielding that on robots. And then there is a system called Orca and there's Navigan, and these are more data-driven approaches. Um, but um, you know, I guess I guess the, the bottom line is, is that we're still really filling out the space, which is why people are so excited about it. So so you know, there are some okay, known constants, but yeah, there isn't like a great, you know, this is how good it is just yet. Yep, yep, great. Uh, Arpan has a question. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk, Justin. So I don't work on robotics. I work on software systems. So my general question was that when you deploy such robots, which routinely deal with human beings, like in your in a competition or even for production, are there any certifications that you have to go through for the software? Um, there is an ANSI certification uh, for robots that interact with people. Uh, I, I have to admit that I, I think it I think it touches on some important aspects, not all important aspects. Um, there isn't a general HRI certification. NIST is working on that. They've invited people to to kind of uh, walk through with them, not so much on a certification for robots, but a standardization for how to study HRI. Um, but the uh, or the uh, ANSI ISO certification is basically says that there should be force torque sensors in every joint of the robot, so it can uh, so it can measure how much force it's acting on its environment. Um, you know, uh, the positive of that is that if the programmers are savvy, then they can say there's a force acting on the system that I'm not expecting. I'm going to emergency stop. The negative of that is that there's nothing in there that says I should emergency stop. So, you know, you could also end up with a, a very good log of how much, you know, force you enacted on a person when you squished them like a bug, right? So, you know, there's sort of this trade off here, um, a, you know, but it's a step in the right direction to be sure. Okay, but do you routinely like add fault tolerance mechanisms in your software or because you are not making a production robot yet, you don't worry about those? Yeah, I don't worry about it. Uh, you know, I, I, I want to get uh, more force torque and tactile sensing because in part because I'm interested uh, in perception and in machine perception. And so the tactile sensing problem is very interesting to me, uh, you know, and but, you know, if, if I'm going to use uh, any number of techniques to certify the safety of the robot, um, that's something I view as more like on the industrial side. You know, when I'm in an ex a highly experimental environment, it's unlikely that that I'm necessarily going to produce anything that's certifiable. But there are people who work on that problem. So, for instance, Ufuktaku over here uh, does formal systems verification, and there is a notion of supervised autonomy. The supervisor is ma is maintaining the safety of the system by setting a set of constraints, uh, and then you know, the autonomous portions are using whatever you're using to achieve autonomy, you know, and then so the behavior is sort of like, you know, babysat by this thing that's doing formal verification to produce a system that is not going to, for instance, exert too much torque or something of that nature. All right, thank you. Yeah, of course. Oh, Jim's got a question, great. Yeah. Jim. Yeah, I just looked up uh, Jose's contest in 2001. And Jose was delivering hors d'oeuvres in 2001. Now, it didn't do a great job of it, but it did an OK job of it. It didn't get knocked over. And I wonder why we're still delivering hors d'oeuvres or drinks or whatever. We wanted to deliver drinks. Yeah. Um, what what um, took so long? And I'm not, please, I'm not criticizing. What did we No, do? no, not at all. Um, I don't think I have a good answer on that. But I have, I have a good answer on what my response is to that. So. Um, I want to think of the, the best way to frame this. Um, I think that there are a lot of teams in RoboCup at home. There's what's called the technical committee. The technical committee writes the rule book every year. And I served on the technical committee and now I'm on the executive committee. The executive committee is intended to steer the league. And when you're in a technical committee meeting, there's always someone in there who's saying, I want to do this round because I can solve this problem and get a lot of points and then my team might be able to win. And what they're not really accounting for is that all the other teams also have solutions to this and they might win too. So there are rounds that everyone participates in uh, because they kind of represent the easy tasks. Um, and so, mm -hmm. so serving drinks is, is kind of in that category as is storing groceries. Like you do it because if you don't do it, everything else is much more difficult. Uh -huh. So this is expected. Okay. This is expected. And so um, when I started my term as a member of the executive committee, we started to delineate a process by which we would sunset tasks or make them more difficult. And so uh, the first year of my term on the EC was like right before COVID hit. Uh, and so we went to a completely different 
format where it was online and it was in simulation. Uh, and now we're having what we call the roadmap meetings. And the roadmap is intended to say, this is how well we perform on different components of these tasks. And all the teams know that like person recognition is like an important component or like um, things like sort algorithms. If you've seen like, like deep sort and these different algorithms where it's like, uh, take an object recognition algorithm, marry it to a common filter or something else that's making a motion prediction. And then you kind of combine your motion prediction plus your, your embedding for the person to say, this is who I think the person is, or this is what I think the object's motion is, right? So that's a thing that's a known quantity in RoboCup at home. Like everyone has some version of that running on their robot for identifying human trajectories. And so what we're trying to do is identify the sub problems that are actually addressed in each of these tasks. Progress along those sub problems, like teams should be able to perform at least this well on this, therefore the task must be at least this difficult, right? And so like store groceries is still objects, and I'm, I'm citing this because this is the one I was thinking about earlier today. Store groceries is still objects placed on a table and then you place it on a shelf. And they're mostly boxes and cylinders and they're, far enough apart that your object recognition algorithm isn't going to mess it up. And, um, and I'm proposing that we're going to move to a model where everything's in a grocery bag and the robot's kind of reaching into the bag, right? Which is a much harder problem, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's kind of what we're doing to address that. Okay. Well, make it hard. Let's make it, make it interesting. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I don't want to participate in it if it's not going to be challenging, right? Yeah. Yeah, what's up? Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. If no, uh, no one else has a question, I'll, I'll, I'll go again. I'll, I'll uh, yeah, I, I'm uh, really curious about um, the role that uh, um, teleoperation could serve as a way of kind of doing binary search a, a, as to where, where the gap is between, you know, what the, what the robot it, it can really do in terms of its mechanics and, and sensory suite and the recognition versus what a human can do. And so, so in some sense, teleoperation, you could uh, you could even force the human to 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 use the recognition outputs basically, and uh, it, it seems to me like uh, it might be you know a really flexible tool for for figuring out you know wh where where's the gap and which parts you know provide how much useful information in in achieving uh, an overall task and and yeah you could even have the the teleoperator could 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 just uh, you know hit certain phrases, et cetera. Um, yeah, so what, what are your thoughts on that as a, as a strategy? I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah, I've thought about doing something of that nature because I, I think that that really is, um, it, 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 one, it, it addresses the mechanical limitations of the robot, but two, uh, it does address sort of like where the human attention is going. And I think that that's a really exciting thing. Uh, I've got, one project in progress that's kind of of that flavor right now, but I don't want to discuss it too much because we're, you know, we haven't, you know, we're not too close to publication on it yet. It's, it's in its nascent phases, but I do think that, um, that basically uh, solving via teleoperation is a really interesting thing, uh, partly just to see if it is solvable with what you have, right? And then partly to train machine learning models so the one that I can mention is we have a, a data set for social navigation called ScanB, and that is paired with instruction, operator instructions to the robot, uh, driving the robot around. It's not quite the same because it's not addressing like what was relevant to the operator, but you can envision that you could do some machine learning techniques that are currently very popular uh, to try to figure out what, was, what the person was reacting to. Um, and so, so that's kind of the thing. The current fielded version uses reinforcement learning to learn how to, how to navigate through a crowd. Uh, and this is something that we fielded on um, a Boston Dynamics spot, uh, walking through crowds during football games. Yeah, cool, but cool. in terms of the, dy uh, the, the um, domestic context and actually performing these things, yeah, I think that uh, going through and either doing demonstrations like that or not doing demonstrations, but just doing analyses like that is really interesting. That is also part of the motivation behind like the VR experiments. Like the reason I'm saying VR is so I can build high fidelity models of what actually happens, right? Uh, fielding it on the robot is, is, a, is an entirely different question, right? But like gathering the scientific data that describe what happens during that exchange. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Really well. no, no, sure. Great. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Alan and Nick put their hands up at at at, at I swear within one microsecond of each other. I, I, I'm going to uh, 
uh, uh, Alan, I think you, you were a microsecond ahead and then Nick. Okay. Thanks, Justin. Good stuff. Thanks. Um, so just to comment on my, Michael's question about teleoperation, when we were doing our smart wheelchair work, we used a Wizard of Oz technique where we could fake capabilities of the robot. It's a lot easier to implement with a graduate student pretending to be the robot than to actually write the code to do it. So you can test out all sorts of different configurations very quickly. Um, it's a good thing to do. But my question is more, I mean, I have two questions. One is just about obviously the, the convention in North America is you pass to the right and you are forcing everyone to pass to the left, which may have confounded your results a bit. Whereas if you go to England, typically they pass on the left, but if you get all the Americans there in the summer, they're insisting on passing on the right. So you get all these collisions and then English learn to defer to the Americans and pass on the right, you know? So in other words, the robot should learn these social conventions, right? And, and see what works and, and adapt to the society that it's in. Yeah, so, so um, uh, I, um, I hate to respond with, oh, we've thought of this, but we've thought of this. This is a, this is a good question. <laughs> <Yeah, appreciate it. laughs> uh, so my one collaborator on most of these studies was, was Rayith Mursky, who was doing a postdoc here at the time. Uh, she just took a faculty post at Bar Ilan in Israel. Uh, and what she's doing is getting uh, an identical setup with, uh, so we've got the building-wide intelligence PWI bots, and we've also been doing some of these experiments on the Boston Dynamics spots. Uh, so she's purchasing two spots and, um, and setting them up identically to our setup uh, to do uh, not just replication studies, but uh, we're going to do some studies of cultural differences uh, that we're pretty excited about. And yeah, yeah. yeah uh, I mean, cultural differences are, are, you know, exciting and challenging in their own way. And you also mentioned the Wizard of Oz technique, which, which is a favorite of mine for figuring out what's important. Uh, and there is another thing, which is the Oz of Wizard technique, which is figuring out where your detectors are failing. Uh, so you have something that's autonomous and then supplemented by human capability, and you're kind of annotating where, where it went wrong. You know, so that's nice. that was uh, that was a paper by uh, my doctoral supervisor Brian Scassolati, who was headed up by Aaron Steinfeld at CMU. Yeah, I guess the other thing about social conventions is some societies are more polite than others. I hate to bring up Americans again, but you know, uh, people are more deferential in other societies, and they would wait for someone to declare their intention before they act. Right? Oh yeah, of course. Um, I mean, I mean, I I think that um, you know. The that that so I mean the number of wrinkles in social navigation is part of what makes it so intriguing, right? Yeah. You know, like with, with what I really want to get down to is um, you know a detector that's able to tell me what the right course of action is, or at least what a person's intentions are. Uh, you know, sort of like if you look back ten years, what people were doing with uh, effective computing, uh, like Daniela Russo's work, where it's like the person's happy or sad, or you know, and like. Uh, getting to that, but getting to that where it's built into an action context uh, for the reason that, you know, you could build these detectors and start to work on fully autonomous human robot interaction, which I think is still, it looks like a pipe dream to people who've been working on it for a while. But I think that there, you know, there is, there's actually a route there now, like, like, you know, neural networks have gotten good enough and the techniques for the studies of these science have gotten good enough and the instrumentation has gotten flexible enough uh, to where we can do some real damage on that front. And I think that, you know, um, that, 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 that wasn't true even two years ago, right? Like, you know, like, like, like the techniques just weren't there, you know, um, and, but it's, it's really where things are starting to loosen up to where you could start to do something that looks like fully autonomous HRI. Um, what's your, what's your hunch about where the, the, the key niche is in the home. What's the what's the killer app for the, the killer app? The home in the, I think that, in the near future? I think that tidying, cleaning, and and uh, and cooking are are the big ones. That that basically, if you can go to your home and there's no maintenance anymore, and there's no like need to take care of yourself, uh, I don't think that's where other people put it. I think that other people put it at care for people who would otherwise be in assisted care facilities, you know, increasing independence. I think that the funding is there for the for the care part and that's great. But I think that like the thing that's gonna, you know, make you super rich is the other side. I, I think that care is super important because like 
it's like one of the most noble things you can do is help a person to have personal dignity and being able to maintain independence and lead the life that they want to. Um, but you know, the I think that you know the Microsoft equivalent in the robotics space is going to be the one that's providing you know something that that'll do your laundry and and cook dinner for you. You know, like they, there's just a much bigger market. You know, I, even then, like like defense, like people talk about like needing like lots of robots for defense, and of course, defense having just super plentiful money in the U.S., which is true. Um, but you know, like like defense is you know like like you know. If you, if you think about like Lockheed Martin versus Microsoft, you know, like, you know, which one's going to get you like a super yacht that can fly is probably Microsoft, right? You know, so just as a as a thought, <laughs> you know, yeah. Okay, uh, uh, yeah, great. Uh, I'd like to get to uh, Nick. Uh, so yeah, of thanks for thanks for your patience, Nick. Oh, we well, are uh, not hearing you uh, for some reason. Still not. Um, hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Great, thanks. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. And thank you, yeah, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. Uh, so my question is not so much technical. Um, so I was part of like uh, one of like UBC's uh, engineering design team where our goal for like the longest time had been uh, participating in like these competitions. And like the main bottleneck has been essentially more like funding and the issue that like a lot of these like standardized robots are like not very affordable. So you having like more insight into like the industry, I was wondering uh, if you have some uh, insight as to if um, these like standardized robots, if they're gonna become more affordable for like you know, future research groups and so on. Thank you. Well, uh, yeah, I know that's a good question. Uh, I, we, we deal with this every year with RoboCup because it's very expensive. To participate like if you look at just our participation this year um not our actual costs for like the machines and the research right just like us getting to the competition and back um for the domestic standard platform league team we're going to spend probably about 30 to forty thousand dollars. right you have to ship a crate you know worldwide you have to get it back and forth um you have to go through customs you have to send people over there uh, you have to have hotels, um, you know, and then you have to deal with all the wrinkles of, you know, being in a different country. Uh, so I would say that like, like, like absolute rock bottom bargain basement prices for participating in RoboCup at home is $20,000 per year. And that's assuming that your research funding is paying for everything else somehow. Um, we participate in the domestic standard platform league where you're given a robot. Of course, being given a robot is an enormous challenge, right? Uh, we applied to Toyota Research Institute years ago to get one of their human support robots. We had to put together an application that had things like, uh, you know, like a sheaf of our research papers plus videos of the robots actually performing the tasks. Uh, and then, you know, once you're in RoboCup at home, you have to submit a whole set of other videos that are like your qualifier that says that your team can produce this stuff consistently. Right. Um, and if you don't qualify for RoboCup at home, eventually, like you get like some grace period, Toyota takes your robot back. Right. So, um, yeah. And then there's the open platform leagues where people are building their own robots. Um, you know, fundraising for something like that's really challenging. It's also really challenging inside the league because there are people who want to participate because they want to compete. And then there are people who are basically paying for this out of their research funds. Um, you know, our model is paying for it out of our research funds by making sure that all this stuff is producing stuff that we can publish as well. Um, you know, uh, I've seen teams that are like student teams that are like student teams for the sake of being student teams compete really well. Uh, a good example is Walking Machine, which is at, um, uh, uh, it's like University of Montreal. Uh, they're, uh, funded their team partly through uh, like a series of collaborations with like businesses in Quebec and the Quebec government uh, who are, you know, they provide some lubrication for schools and things of that nature. Uh, they built their thing custom. It was largely 3D printed. Uh, a lot of the teams who compete in open platform league, which I think is 
probably like, like I'm in DSPL, which is a unique software engineering challenge, but like the robots that perform really well are the custom built robots, right? You know, like they're just like, someone's like, I need to know which person's speaking. So they put a microphone array on and I need a robot that manipulates things really well. So they get a UR5, you know, um, you know, but the custom robots, they do have some really clever tricks that they use uh, to reduce cost. Um, one team takes like, like lithium ion batteries off of drills and makes like an array of those. And, you know, that's a really inexpensive way to get lithium ion batteries. Almost every team uses gaming laptops. Um, walking machine, the Montreal team has a 3D printed arm that they built. Uh, it looks like a clone of the UR5, but it is, you know, definitely an open spec thing that they built. Um, you know, I think that that's the route over it, but like, yeah, uh, the way we got through was, was research funds. And the other thing I've seen is like very aggressive fundraising. You know, the, the thing that, that seems to work for the teams who are student driven rather than, uh, like, like faculty driven is just super aggressive fundraising because, because probably like your initial in, you know, our initial in was probably $70,000 to a hundred thousand, you know? So like, you do have to come up with that money somehow. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, there, there is, there's, there are people who, who do super uh, bargain thing. There's, there's the, uh, uh, there's the RoboCup at Home Education League, and they do a thing where they have like high school students hack. And that thing is like a real stripped down robot. It's based on a Roomba base. Um, and then it has like a, like a servo driven arm. So there is, you know, there is an extreme version of this that gets you down to a few thousand dollars, but that, that's, that's really driving it to a very particular extreme to make it affordable. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I don't see any last call for questions. Um, I don't see any further. So um, yeah, maybe with that we can uh, we can wrap wrap it up. So th thanks again uh, so much, uh, Justin, for for dropping by and, and virtually and uh, and giving the talk. Really appreciate it. Oh yeah, and I appreciate yeah. the opportunity to catch up a bit and see y'all. Uh, yeah. yeah, thanks so much. Absolutely. Let, let, let us know when you're uh, when you're back in town in in Vancouver at some point. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely am trying to, to to make it back just to visit sometime. So whenever that happens, I'll definitely come by UBC and and uh, and see what's going on. All right. Awesome. Thanks so much, Justin. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All. Excellent. Cheers. Bye bye, all. Yep. Ciao, y'all.